I'm very, very excited to, to have you um, join us for Paul Shaw's lecture. Um, Mad, bad, but good to know, a survey of type specimens offline and online who kind of take us on this really wonderful journey uh, into type specimen with that exist online, um, various themes around it, and and some really great insights into those things. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Paul. Paul Shaw is a de design historian with 40 years of experience as a calligrapher, type designer, and graphic designer. He's taught the history of type at the School of Visual Arts, Parsons School of Design, California Rare Book School. Since the summer 2020, he's been compiling a list of online digitized type specimen, which is uh, the heart and soul of this presentation. Um, he's been posting a lot of that information on his website uh, under the blue pencil rubric. We'll post a link in a second to that so you can kind of check out the material and there'll also be a special, um, Paul was kind enough to set up a, a special page on the website where you can see everything he's sharing. You can you can click and, and in a second when we get started, I'll post that link and, and post it periodically. Uh, Paul is also the author of Revival Type, Digital Typefaces, Inspired by the Past. Um, he also authored uh, Helvetica and the New York City Subway System, a book which is in two editions. Uh, the latest one was uh, published by MIT Press. He is also co-author of Black Letter Type and National Identity and a co-curator of that exhibition, which was held here in the Little Balance Center back in, I think, 1998, something like that. So I was uh, fortunate enough to work with Paul when I was a student here at Cooper on that exhibition. And uh, I think it, it sparked my love of type and typography. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that we can have Paul here with us to share his insight into uh, type. So I'll turn it over to Paul and I'll get out of the way. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Paul. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Alex, and I'm glad to be back at uh, Cooper Type, though I had hoped it was going to be in person just so we could actually see people after this pandemic. But at least one advantage of doing this online is that we get to see uh, people from across the country, though we're not getting some of our European friends due to the late hour. But I, I think they'll have a chance to see this on Vimeo. So I'm going to get started. Uh, if I can share the screen. Is that visible to everyone? Looks good. So the title uh, comes, was inspired by a specimen, which we're gonna see later, that uh, George Nesbitt uh, put out in 1841 with a page that says, bad and mad. And it made, reminded me immediately of a quote, famous quotation from Lady uh, Caroline uh, Morell about uh, Lord Byron that he was mad, bad, and dangerous to know. So I've kind of garbled it a little bit, but uh, as the title of my talk, because these specimens are good to know, at least some of them. And originally it was gonna be a uh, talk about strictly online specimens because the number of them has grown enormously since I began recording them uh, two years ago. I had done 300 when I first started. I think I got about 1,700 now. And a good half of those have uh, come online in the last year uh, through huge chunks uh, at, in Germany and uh, through St. Bride. And so when I started doing this though, I realized that it was kind of useful to show samples of specimens that have not been digitized yet. And maybe we'll uh, spark their digitization or the redigitization of those that have not been done well. Uh, the survey is focusing on what the specimens, uh, who they were for, what they look like physically, uh, what their content is uh, in terms of what people put into a specimen, and what their content is in terms of what they show, what, what they use as words to show off the typefaces. So those are the focuses of this talk. It's not going to go deep into any particular specimen. Um, it's going to give a survey so you can see sort of how, how diverse uh, the idea of type specimens is, especially today in the digital world. So the first question is, who are type specimens made for? And our assumption would usually be, well, type founders make them for their customers. But as anyone who has studied type specimens knows, another huge group is printers who make specimens for their customers, for their printing customers to show them what typefaces they have available. 
this uh, first um, image is showing you uh, a page from a type foundry specimen. And what, at the bottom of each of these pages, you can see there's a, a link. And those are the links that are in that other document that um, uh, Alex said he's going to uh, provide everybody. Um, this one has been digitized by uh, St. Bride. It's on the Internet Archive. It's Eleanor Wilson and Sons uh, specimen from 1786. There's several others by the foundry. I just chose this one because it's a beautiful page and I love to see big type. It may look like Baskerville to you, but it's a Baskerville knockoff, probably uh, cut by Isaac Moore. And Matthew Carter's big Moore typeface uh, is based on an earlier version of this. An example of a specimen from a printer is this one, another uh, St. Bride uh, digitization. It's the printer uh, Bensley uh, in Andover, England. And in it, he uh, shows you a typeface with, with a uh, excerpt of text and sometimes an illustration. I chose this one because of the illustration, which is in the style of Buick. I don't know if it actually is a Buick or not, uh, but it's a wood engraving. And you're seeing a typeface that would be in uh, the British or English uh, neoclassical style, influenced by Didot and Bedoni, but with a British twist. Uh, it's just labeled double pica. The foundry is not identified. This is the earliest specimen that John Baskerville put out. It's not been digitized. There's another one from 1854 that has been. It's different. Uh, this one is, uh, I, I think, earlier. Uh, Columbia University owns it. And it's the first showing of Baskerville's type. And he's announcing uh, his edition of Virgil, which is the first book three years later, which shows the typeface. But here he's showing you uh, the type, both the Italic and the uh, Roman. And at the bottom, he's advertising for his edition of Virgil. The other uh, 1854 specimen online uh, simply shows you the typeface in multiple sizes, which is why I believe it's a later uh, copy. This is, a, this is a single sheet, so it's a broadside. The other, along with uh, type founders and printers as our most obvious uh, sources for the people who put out type specimens, there are others that we often overlook. One is printing, uh, printing material houses, that is businesses that sold presses, and other things that printers needed. And some of them, some of them they sold typefaces as well, which meant they got typefaces from multiple uh, foundries. Uh, this specimen from a printing house in Boston, Curtis and Mitchell, has been digitized by RIT. And you're seeing the, uh, the title page here where they're emphasizing the types, borders, cuts, and rules, as well as printing materials that they have available uh, for printers. I'm going to show you only using one page per specimen so I can get a lot more into this talk. So if you want to see what some of these things look, like, look inside, then you can go to the, to the websites for those that have been digitized. There are other uh, people who come up with type specimens besides those three. Uh, another is type houses, which I'm not showing here. Type houses are a 20th century concept that is a business that would purchase types from many foundries, and then they would offer proofs of the type, not the actual type, to customers. They would, they would print uh, whatever the customer's text was uh, and either give them galley proofs to make uh, zinc plates from, or they would loan them uh, the type that had been set up to print from, and then it would come back to them. Uh, a few uh, type houses have, have, some step, have some of their books that, uh, digitized, uh, but I didn't include them into this talk because I thought, didn't think about them until the last moment. This specimen is a more unusual one. It comes from a paper company, Eastern, Eastern Company in Maine. And in, the, in 1948, they did two sets uh, or series of posters, broadsides that were folded up and came with some uh, in sets with some additional information. And each of the uh, posters was usually about a typeface. Uh, one or two in the set in the series wasn't, but most of them were about a typeface. And this one on Cheltenham, surprisingly enough, was chosen by W.A. Dwiggins, 
Uh, the initial A, of course, gives the game away that that is a Dwiggins design, but why he would choose Tw Cheltenham surprises me. Uh, the, the most famous broadside probably in the series is the one that Bruce Rogers did for his own centaur type face. And I don't think any of them have been digitized, though there is one book dealer who's got images available online. All right, let's get into what uh, the typefaces looked like physically. So here's a list of some of the possibilities. It, broadsides, meaning large posters printed on one side, booklets, small bound uh, volumes, and then larger bound volumes in terms of page count uh, in a small format, octavo. Sometimes these things have fold outs because uh, the pages won't, uh, the type won't fit easily. Sometimes there are fold outs that have been designed not to be put into a specimen from the type founder, but to be put into another book. Uh, usually a print, a book about printing and uh, the instruction in how to print. So we'll see one that comes in an encyclopedia. Then we're gonna look at books that get even bigger than octavo in format, quartos and an occasional folio. And as books got bigger, type founders began to realize that to keep, to wait a year or two to make a new book meant they wouldn't be able to tell people about their latest typefaces. So they began to issue sheets or, and supplements. Some of these uh, ended up getting bound into uh, specimen books and others remained loose. And then as we get towards the end of the uh, 19th century, we start to see um, type founders issuing specimens that instead of being large or small, they're intended for a single typeface or once the idea of type families gets developed for a type family or related uh, material to go with a typeface. And once you've got the idea of printing specimens only for one typeface or uh, one type family, the next step logically would be to print individual sheets for the different sizes of type. Remember, we're talking about metal type and every single size is a different design, even if there's family resemblance. And once you start printing individual sheets for different sizes, the simplest way to keep updating is to give your, your customers a binder, three ring binder, and let them assemble their uh, specimen books. Sometimes individual sheets were put into uh, boxes, uh, initially uh, cardboard or paper boxes as sort of portfolios. And then at least one uh, foundry uh, made a wooden box for its uh, loose sheets. And uh, another foundry later on made acrylic boxes, which I'm not gonna show tonight, uh, but I'll mention it when we get to that point. Another place that uh, specimens showed up, uh, especially in the 20th century, but even as early as the 1830s in Germany, was uh, as inserts into periodicals, either uh, printing industry uh, periodicals or later on house uh, magazines from the foundries themselves, like the monotype recorder and upper and lower case from ITC. And then there's all sorts of odd ways that foundries have used to uh, create their uh, specimens. And <laughs> one that several foundries have done is, is making a calendar. And I'll show you one example of that. And now that we're in the uh, digital era, <clears throat> some, some foundries have converted their uh, print specimens to PDFs and others have made PDFs, which never have seen, uh, never become printed except for customers printing them out from their own computers. So those are the different formats and sizes that I'm gonna cover in the next roughly 40 slides. Here is the first known type specimen from Earhart Ratdolt of Augsburg. It's a broadside printed in 1486. He was both a printer and a punch cutter. So therefore, an example of, 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 of type from a type founder or type maker, as well as a printer. Uh, it has 11 uh, sizes of type. Um, Cardo Locos on a small booklet for a French uh, publisher, uh, ex uh, explaining all the different sizes and their, and their sources. It's worth uh, purchasing, it's still available online. 
you've got several rotundas, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I think 11, three Romans and a Greek. And the A is a woodcut, the initial A. The uh, online digitization uh, <clears throat> from the German library of this uh, broadside shows you the writing on the back. Other, other online digitizations only show you the front. The broadside uh, lasted for, for, for a long time. We'll see uh, William Caslon's broadside of 1734. But by the 20th century, it was not uh, the major way of, uh, of selling your typefaces or promoting them. However, Frederick Gowdy, who had a small foundry, it was himself and his wife and his son, uh, when he uh, decided to announce the typefaces he had in 1921, he chose the broadside format, and he clearly had that of Caslon in mind and possibly Ratgolds in, his for, in, in, in how he laid it out. Uh, this is for the village letter foundry, and the spelling foundry with the extra E is how some people used to spell it, not simply a gouty uh, archaicism. And then my third example of a broadside, or maybe it's more accurately a poster, is, a, uh, is one from the Fuse uh, font sets of the early 1990s. This is uh, for the Luscious typeface by Jeffrey Keaty. It came out in Fuse 4, 1991. And for each of the typefaces, uh, Fuse sent a, a cardboard box that had a disc with your font on it, and it had a little folded up poster promoting the typeface and get in a little booklet explaining some of the theory or background behind the typefaces because they were all intended to be experimental. I chose Luscious because I like what, Ke what Keaty's uh, choice of text. He's linking his typeface, one of those that Stephen Heller uh, heavily criticized back in the 90s as ugly. Uh, but here uh, Keaty is linking his typeface to uh, some of the typefaces of the artistic printing movement of the 1870s and 80s in the United States and Europe. Uh, and you can see it very specifically right there in the middle. Uh, the earliest uh, booklet or small uh, bound type specimen is that from Christopher Plantan uh, in Antwerp. Plantan was a printer. He uh, bought types made by Garamont and Grand John. He also commissioned types uh, from people like Vanden Kara and Guillaume, and his uh, printing office survives as a museum in Antwerp. It's one of the most important places anybody interested in type can visit in Europe. Forget the Louvre, go to the museum, uh, Plantin Museum in Antwerp when you go to Europe, and the, and the Bedoni Museum. Plantin put out a small specimen in 1567 showing the types he owned that were available for his customers to use. What I'm showing you here is a type from uh, Garamont. And it's through Plantan that we know a lot about Garamont, Grand John, and their contemporaries. Oops. A small format book booklet became a book, octavo size, and that was the dominant form of type specimen into the 19th century. I've chosen one from 1825 here to show how it's still a small book. This is from the Fan Street Letter Foundry of William Thorogood, uh, the successor to Robert Thorne. And I chose a page showing that what happens as type began to get large in the 19th century, very large, 24 line pica. Pica is 12 point. So 24 times 12 is 288 point. That's roughly a four inch typeface. Not big by our contemporary standards, but enormous by the standards of the day. And the only way you're going to fit it onto this small book is to turn your type sideways. Your other choice, which some foundries had already figured out decades before uh, a thorough good, was simply make a page that folded out. This is not the earliest. It's just one that I chose from the Gillet foundry in Paris because the typeface in it, I don't know what the source, unless it's Gillet himself uh, did, has little tick marks on the L which show an influence of the Roman de Wa. It's actually quite a nice typeface. Maybe somebody can uh, digitize it now that they've got a source. And you can see it's probably a three panel sheet of paper, maybe 
can't tell if there's two extra small full, uh, creases at the edges. This comes from uh, the St. Bride uh, digitizations on Internet Archive. And if you're looking at their, their digitizations, you have to look for sheets like this in a separate file because the Internet Archive format does not allow for foldouts to be uh, integrated with the main part of the book. The most famous broadside besides Rattel is the one that William Caslon issued in 1734. You normally see it online from a number of sources as a broadside, but it originally was folded up and placed into Chambers Encyclopedia. Uh, there's one uh, copy from the 1728 Encyclopedia online, which is not done in 1728 because the broadside is 1734. It was put into that book almost a decade later. And this is where dates of typefaces and specimens can be incredibly tricky. Uh, this is, uh, instead of showing you the 1728 encyclopedia, I chose a 1750 with a different variant of Kazan's broadside because the digitization by the Getty uh, shows it in place as opposed to opened up. So you're seeing here the title page of the Chambers uh, Cyclopedia. You're seeing the page that precedes the specimen. And it's a, it's a page about the definition of the word letter. And they're showing you types set by Caslon. But then when you turn the page, you get Caslon's broadside. It's not cut as it is here. It's folded up and the Getty has opened it up and you can see an extra fold on the left. But if you want to see it without uh, the cut in the middle, you can, there are plenty of examples uh, online and the, from the University of Wisconsin. There are other uh, specimens besides Caslons that ended up in books. Uh, they're smaller. And they tend to be uh, in sections devoted to the type specimen. Uh, and so in a sense, they're, they're you know, booklets that have been inserted into a book. Uh, this one is from uh, the book Drucker Kunst und Schriftgießerei, I'm doing my, any good German, uh, by Christian Gessner of 1740. And in it, there's a specimen from the Breitkopf foundry of Leipzig. And you're seeing the title page of the book and the title page of the specimen, which begins around, I think, page 145 um, on the left. And then you're seeing a spread from the specimen uh, enlarged. There are a number of these. Uh, and this is an, uh, an American example. I think the earliest one, it's from the Printer's Guide or Introduction to Art of Printing by C.S. Van Winkle in New York in 1818. And in his book near the back, he's got two type specimens, one from the D&G Bruce foundry and another from Elihu, Roots, El El Elihu White's foundry, both in New York. And so here you're seeing the title page of the entire book, the title page of the, of the Bruce specimen and one page from the Bruce specimen, which I chose because the text is, has a, as its content, American cities. Uh, and the type is uh, at a size where they want to put it sideways, just as in the Fan Street Foundry. Once again, a very small book. The earliest, as far as I know, uh, large uh, book type specimen that is bigger than a octavo are the ones that Bodoni did in 1788. Now, if you look at this page from uh, the one on his capitals and his, and his uh, scripts, you'll realize that the text area showing the typeface is small enough to fit on an octavo. But only simply made a bigger book just to, you know, make it look grandiose. And this is about a folio size. This book is not as well known as his 1818 specimen, which is our next slide. The 1818 one is a bit smaller though, whether it's a large quarto or a small folio, I'm not a specialist in uh, determining what quote, where the dividing line is. But once again, you can see Bodoni has huge margins. He now has got a border that surrounds every sample of his type. And by this point, 
Uh, the book came out five years after his death, produced by his foreman and his widow. At this point, he had another, you know, 25 years worth of typefaces uh, to show, and he required two volumes. So this, as far as I know, is the first two-volume type specimen. Fournier's Manuel uh, Typographique is not entirely a type specimen in its two volumes, which, which is what gave uh, Bodoni uh, the idea for the name of his book, the Manuel Typographico. So his book is strictly a specimen and no information on on printing and making type. There are a number of uh, different uh, digitizations of this. I've taken it from the one that Octavo did uh, back in uh, early 2000s or late 1990s, I've forgotten, uh, as a CD-ROM. And it's available from two different sources, uh, the Rare Book Room and also uh, Southern Methodist University. And then there's also uh, uh, other other uh, copies of this uh, manual that's been digitized. What you're seeing here, by the way, is the largest size of Bedoni's type. It's the model for ITC Bedoni 72. By the middle of the 19th century, the specimen books, for the most part, weren't getting larger in 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 uh, in dimension, but they were getting larger in page count. 200, 300 pages was becoming fairly routine. And in the early 1860s, the L. Johnson Foundry of Philadelphia issued one with 601 pages. And so I don't know of any, anything earlier than that. And so I date that as the beginning of what I call the massive type specimens, which begin to be a much more common in the later 19th and early 20th century. This is probably the last uh, of the massive uh, type specimens made in metal. This is Linotype's Big Red from 1939 that is over 1,200 pages. And I've shown it opened up so you can sort of get a sense of, of its size by seeing the, number, the thickness of the book. And if you've ever seen a copy and, and held it, you'll realize how heavy these things became. Uh, this, uh, this is showing Memphis uh, the type. The, the, the typeface that was put out originally uh, by Stempel in Germany and issued as Linotype uh, by the Linotype companies in uh, Germany, England, and the United States. One uh, two-volume specimen that came out in the 19th and the 20th century is from the Duberni and Peignot foundry. They did a two-volume uh, specimen in the mid-20s, and then a, a second one in the mid-30s. This is the one from 1935. And what's interesting about their two-volume uh, specimen as, is that they uh, added um, tabs to the book so you could find the different sections. And if you look at this, and if you look at the tabs, you're going to see that a lot of the stuff that's in the uh, specimen is not what we think of as type. And I'll get to that a little later in this talk. But here you're seeing uh, the, the uh, section header for uh, the part that has uh, signs and figures. And I love this book for the, the photographs they've used uh, to uh, indicate the different uh, sections. This one of the typewriter. Surprisingly, in terms of pages, the largest uh, massive type specimen is not one from the metal foundry era, but from the digital era the fourth and last edition of the font book from font, uh, from font Shop that Eric Speakerman and his colleagues put out in 2006. And uh, it doesn't seem as heavy as the others because the paper is thin and it's a narrower format. But it supposedly has, what, what is it, 1,700 pages, and I've forgotten now how many uh, fonts in it. This is still an incredibly useful book. And if it's available, I would urge people to buy a copy. As I indicated earlier, when the foundries began to uh, create these, these large books, just a couple hundred pages, it became diff more difficult to keep updating them. Either they kept adding pages to unbound copies and selling them, and that's why a lot of the dates on title pages are unreliable, or they began to simply produce uh, loose uh, supplements uh, showing one or more typefaces uh, which they would send out to their customers uh, and the customers uh, would often bind them in to an existing uh, specimen book. Uh, this is uh, the earliest 
supplement that I know of from the Bruce Foundry in New York in 1867 that went with their 1865 book. And they kept issuing uh, you know, sp uh, supplements for a, a long time. Their 1869 uh, book had supplements that, that, that continued for 12 years beyond the next specimen book, which is very peculiar. Uh, this uh, supplement, uh, numbers one and two of leaves from the De Laurent and de Berny uh, foundry, one of the predecessors of uh, de Berny and Peignot, uh, is bound into an older uh, specimen book in the, in the copy at Columbia. Uh, and that copy even has some, some uh, supplements uh, numbered as eight and nine in it. I don't know if, it ha if it's got the, the numbers in between. Um, in the late 19, 1890s, uh, the type foundries began to commission typefaces from artists. And usually the first two uh, that are mentioned are uh, George Oriol in France and Otto Ekman in Germany uh, with dates of 1900 and, uh, and 1901. But uh, Eugene Grasse, the famous poster designer was commissioned also to do a typeface. It's usually dated 1900, but the uh, Bibliothèque Fourny has online a specimen from 1898. So that these new, Digitization of specimens, I think, is giving us new insights into type history, and we're going to have to revise some of the stuff we've been reading in numerous books. And this is the Bibliothèque Fourny's uh, cover of their digitization of the Grasset uh, specimen. Unfortunately, it's been bound uh, in the library, so that yellow stripe at the, uh, at the left is not part of the original uh, specimen. But I think this is the first specimen that, that was made only for a typeface. And that became a common thing uh, in the 20th century to make specimens just for a single typeface or a type family. And here is uh, a page from a specimen for a type family, that of Univer or Universe from de Berny and Peignot in 1960. My credit here is incorrect. Uh, and this particular page from the specimen is showing you uh, graphically the universe uh, family of 21 uh, different members and comparing it to a typeface called Europe, which has much fewer. If you don't know the typeface Europe, that was the French name for Futura. So this was part of the advertising to, to tell people, forget your Futura type, you should be using universe. In the early 80s, people were still doing small specimen uh, for individual typefaces. This one from Autologic, a photo type company in, uh, in Switzerland and in California. And they issued uh, the typeface Trinité by Bram de Deuce. And it's a very distinctive typeface and that de Deuce uh, created three different versions of ethers and descenders, as well as, uh, as swashes that could be uh, added to type to the capitals to make, uh, and some of the lowercase to make swash letters, only possible through photo composition. And of course, a similar thing could be done today through digital type. And that concept is illustrated on the cover of this specimen. Individual specimens sometimes uh, can't contain sample designs showing how the type could be used. This one for the city typeface by Georg Trump that Berthold put out in 1930, the same typeface that Paul Rand used as the basis for the IBM logo he designed in the 50s. Uh, this specimen uh, has is full of pages showing how the type could be used. So on the left, you're seeing uh, a diagram for a BMW, I think motorcycle uh, engine uh, with uh, set in city. And on the right, you're seeing a perfume ad. And the whole thing is uh, a spiral bound. It's the earliest spiral bound specimen I have come across. Putting uh, single sheets into binders. I don't know who first came up with it. This is from the 1960s and I'm sure there was a uh, there were examples before that. This is from Monotype. Uh, and 
when you put them in binders, it's easy to keep adding and changing your type specimens. And so if you, so if you, you withdraw a face from the market, you just tell your customers to take it out of the binder, whether they follow the instructions or not. You know, if you have a new type face, even if it's only one or two point sizes, you can make a specimen for that. This is Gil Sands in some of the larger sizes. And you'll notice that uh, the letters differ from size to size in this typeface. Look at the lo lowercase a, if you're not familiar with Gil Sands. Preceding this specimen from the mid 60s is a famous one for the Neue Haas Grotesque, the original name of Helvetica. This was designed by Joseph Muller uh, Brockman. And I'm showing you the cover and then uh, two sections from the book, the page in red, uh, those numbers are indicating the point range sizes. So they've color coded and tabbed uh, the binders so that you can quickly find uh, different sizes of the typeface. I mentioned putting uh, loose specimens into a box. This is one I uh, acquired in the early 1980s from ATF. Uh, online sources uh, dated possibly mid 50s. I know mine is from the, at least from the 60s because mine includes some sheets that are in pale green, which are a uh, universe, a typeface that ATF uh, distributed for De Bernier and Peño after 1961. Each sheet shows on one side, uh, two uh, sizes of the typeface and then two, on, two or more on the other side. And you have to rotate you know, the, the sheets if they're thick uh, paper. I've discovered that mine have been yellowing. You, you can see the ad lib is darker than the other two. They're, the yellow is a normal color, but the, not that brownish color. Later ATF issued these, but they put them into an ugly plastic, uh, brown uh, plastic box. So if you look for one online, look for the, for the wooden case. An example of a portfolio is this very rare in this alphabet specimen, uh, one copy at Yale and one copy owned by Jim Parkinson. In this alphabets was an attempt to, uh, it's kind of a predecessor of letter set. Uh, you got sheets of, of a typeface printed on them and then you cut them up and you glued them down into your design. Uh, and then, I don't know if you could reuse them or not, but you made a, you made a printing plate uh, from your design for letterpress printing. And the sheets came loose in a, in a box. The, the box was designed by W.A. Dwiggins, and he did uh, the, uh, one of the typefaces in the, um, in the set uh, called Boylston, which is an early sort of version of Electra. Uh, Dwiggins was the advisor for this project by Mr. Innes. I don't know when foundries began to simply mail out uh, just single sheet folded specimens as mailers or uh, as, <clears throat> as flyers. But when I was preparing the talk, I came across uh, a couple that I had acquired from House Industries in the 1990s. And this one, I think might, might be one of their first, it's 1995, it's earlier than the other ones I have. And it opens up, it's, it's a newsprint, it opens okay. up in this, uh, you know, psychedelic fashion, though the fonts in it are not a, a psychedelic uh, set. If you look at the uh, at the bottom, you can see the house industry uh, uh, members. I think that's Ken Barber and Andy Cruz, and I'm guessing Rich wrote, and I'm not, I can't remember now who this would be, but I'm sure in the chat, Ken, if Ken Barber's here, he can identify it. Some uh, type companies began to put out uh, house magazines uh, promoting their, their products. Linotype had one. Uh, My Type Reporter is probably the most famous. And ITC did upper and lower case uh, in the phototype era. Uh, one issue of the Monotype Recorder is entirely a type specimen. Uh, it's announcing uh, Times New Roman, designed for the Times of London. And along with giving you uh, the background, uh, of the type, of course, the entire thing is set in Times New Roman, and it has some sample pages. I think UNLC is probably the ultimate of uh, periodicals or house magazines from type foundries. Uh, it lasted from 19, what, 74 to 1999, 25 years. And, you know, to the average graphic designer, it just looks like a really nice, uh, you know, 
magazine about graphic design with articles on calligraphy, typography, advertising, cigar labels, erotic postcards, all sorts of things of interest to designers. But every article is set in an ITC face, which is identified in a tiny caption at the bottom. And then, of course, there would, there would always be a little uh, section where they would announce the newest typefaces from ITC. Uh, surprisingly in a very dull uh, format compared to the rest of the magazine. But there's one issue that's fabulous, September 1978 issue, which has eight pages devoted to ITC Cheltenham with color, which was unusual at that stage of UNLC's uh, lifetime, designed by Herb LeBallon and his staff. And Tony Despina told me years ago when I asked him how long it took them to design these pages, he guessed two weeks for the studio. Because if you look at this page and the next one I'll show you, this is not just ITC Cheltenham straight. There's a lot of cutting of the letters, a lot of ligaturing, a lot of budding, a lot of overlapping. There's no way a customer can achieve this without that extra work themselves. If you look just carefully at um, the RA in graphic here, uh, which is different from the RA in literature, the P8, the HYS here in physical, you can see some of the uh, the razor blade work that they did with the double T in letters. And each of the eight pages, the texts are quotes about type or about uh, writing and letters. Uh, and each arrangement is different. Some are flushed left, rag right, some are centered, some are asymmetrical. This one kind of has a, has a pinwheel effect. I think this is an amazing bit of typography. I think it's the highlight of the LeBallon studio. Makes you actually makes you want to use ITC Cheltenham. I mentioned miscellaneous items and calendars as an example. This is one from the Trillo Foundry in Paris in 1889. It's a fabulous specimen digitized uh, by the Bibliothèque Fournie. Uh, this is the January page. It's from the era of artistic printing, as you can see from the ornate border. And each, each month has, a, has different typefaces and a different design, a different border, a different layout. This is my favorite just for its colors. This may be one of the most unique of all uh, type specimen books in the, in the, and this is from one of the, the Didot member, uh, family members, Jules Didot, son of Pierre, nephew of uh, Fierman. And he did a specimen book in 1824 uh, which not only on the title page has the, the Italian typeface of Caslon and Catherwood shown, uh, but the specimen book is a book for a young girl, as you can see here. It's apparently a companion one for a young boy that I've seen reference to online, but I've not actually seen the book. This one, Columbia has a copy and it's been digitized. And here are two spreads showing uh, some illustrations and text for the young girl along with the typeface. The illustrations are not all from the same source. They're kind of a mishmash of things. I, I chose these because I thought they were just some of the better illustrations. So there's, there's a nice camel uh, in there. This specimen book, which is now available as a PDF download from Emma Gray, originally was a printed book and and I think it's the, the highlight of all the specimens that Rudy Vanderlaans has done for Emma Gray. I think those are worth collecting. He's really overlooked as a typographic designer. Um, but this is my favorite of them all called Historia, where the text is all about uh, the Spanish uh, influence in California and monuments to that, that Rudy has gone, has gone around and photographed and written about. And he's used it to show off the complete Emma Gray uh, type collection. What you're seeing here is a spread. And it shouldn't be surprising if this reminds you of, our, of artistic printing uh, or of uh, fruit crate labels. Garrett Bogie and I were partners in Letter Perfect, a type foundry in the 1990s that's still around. And back then we uh, produced several uh, unusual specimens to promote our types. This one was a reprint of Nicolette Gray's uh, essay from Motif Magazine on Florentine Sans Serif letters from the early 15th century. And we chose that essay because they were the inspiration for our typefaces Donatello, Beata, and Ghiberti. 
And you can see uh, Donatello, my design on the cover. The rubbing in the background is from Garrett Bogey. And this uh, specimen, which I was gonna hand out at the actual, uh, we, if we were at Cooper Union tonight, uh, has a, fold, a double uh, gatefold fold out of one of Garrett's rubbings that inspired the Beata typeface. Uh, these are for sale on my website, uh, some copies. W.A. Dwiggins did an amazing uh, specimen in the 1930s to, to announce his Electra. It was only available in a few small sizes. And so he took a, uh, a, a design that he, a series that he did with the editor of the Saturday Review of Literature, who was a poet. And in the late 20s, uh, Dwiggins would send him a little illustration or a design. And then the poet would add four, a four line quatrain to it. And it would be published on the front page of the Saturday Review of Literature. Uh, they're all in black and white back then. And Dwiggins turned them into color and made them uh, part of his specimen for Electra, which is where the name Emblems and Electra comes from. This is my favorite of them all, type ornament with landscape attached, which shows his uh, stencil uh, designs in use. The Morgan Press, a, uh, essentially a type house up in Westchester, uh, they had a big wood type collection and rather than sell the type, they sold uh, galley proofs from it in the 1960s. Uh, and they did several specimens to show that. This is the first one called wood. These are all wood types. They hired uh, John Alcorn of Pushpin uh, Studios to design them. Uh, he printed everything on different colored sheets. So you find uh, this uh, ochre color, a uh, tomato red and a sort of olive green. And the, in, in, in the book is uh, comb bound one of the earliest examples of a comb bound type specimen. These typefaces were later, digit, uh, were later uh, converted to phototype uh, by headliners. And there's some specimens from headliners that are available di online digitally. I think probably the greatest of all the uh, small specimens for single typeface is the one for Beefer that uh, Cassandra designed. He was a designer of the typeface and of the specimen. He's the famous poster designer of Art Deco. Originally a French specimen was in French for the De Bernier and Peño foundry in 29. An English version came out, I think, a year later. You can find both versions online. This is from Bibliothèque Fournier. English is from Letterform Archive. Uh, the book has got a, a silver paper cover with a die cut hole. And then there are colored uh, translucent pages in between. And, they and as you turn the pages, they change what you're looking at. And you'll see these letters that are black will overlay on those that are yellow when you flip to the left. Underwear, the uh, Finnish Dutch type digital type foundry did a typeface called Sauna in the early 2000s and to promote it, they made a specimen book on water resistant paper so that you could take it into a sauna and read. I've never tried that with my copy. Peter Bielak of Tipo Tech did a specimen several years ago with split pages so you could, you could match different typefaces. It wasn't a new idea with Peter. I have a book from a, from a regular publisher in the 1980s or 90s where the pages are split so that designers could match uh, different typefaces up. But this is the only one I've ever seen from a type foundry. And the last of our printed samples here is uh, one from the Greek foundry, Parachute. A couple of years ago, they issued a specimen in the form of a Pantone fan book, a brilliant concept. And I think these are for sale from their website. But in the digital era, it seems kind of odd to be doing printed specimens and many foundries have given up. Uh, some will do uh, PDFs that you can download and print out yourself. Uh, and I think the first founder to do that was Dutch Type Library. At least that's the first I could find in the Wayback Machine from 2002. A couple of years later, uh, Microsoft did a PDF specimen of their clear type font collection. And that's what I'm showing you here. The console is uh, typeface from Lucas de Groot. And it's more than just a type specimen. It's also a uh, explanation of the collection and its uh, rationale for existing and in general and in each of its individual typefaces. 
Color is something you're going to rarely find in a type specimen prior to the mid 19th century. Uh, you will find it in chromatic type faces. And then you'll later on, you're going to find it as a way to decorate a face, to make a to decorate a specimen, to put as, make, a, make a border around a page or to be used on a title page. But otherwise, color is pretty rare until the 20th century. And then you start to see it uh, much more uh, common as a design element. So just a couple examples here. Uh, here is the source of my title, uh, the page from George Nesbitt's 1841 specimen of chromatic of, of wood type, including some chromatic pages. Uh, but the book that really uh, is famous for chromatic pages was done decades later in 1874 by William H. Page in Connecticut. Uh, his specimen has been digitized uh, through uh, the funding of Nick Sherman and myself years ago at Columbia University on their website. Uh, and it's, a, it's just a stunning book. The color combinations are amazing. The typefaces are weird. The borders are weird. The colors are made possible, I think, financially because uh, of D. Wade's inks. Uh, Mr. Wade gets a little credit at the bottom of each page and one page entirely uh, uh, a shout out to him. And even if the, the facsimile from Rizzoli doesn't match up to the original, if you can't get access to the original at, at a library in New York or elsewhere, then you know, buy the Rizzoli uh, facsimile. There are some examples of chromatic metal type. It's not as, as well known as wood type. This one from the Johnson Foundry in Philadelphia in 1857, I think is the earliest. Uh, you can find it on Nick Sherman's Flickr uh, feed. Uh, though my image comes from Columbia University, I'm sorry, uh, Grillier Club's uh, copy in New York. Uh, in researching uh, this um, presentation, I found uh, chromatic metal type from a number of French and German foundries later in the, in the 19th century as well. So this is not a unique idea here. This is a very strange use of color. This is the Bruce uh, 19, 1853 specimen. It's all black until you get to the end of the book and then there's three or four pages in a riot of color. And what's odd about it is there's no caption explaining what you're looking at other than that it comes from the Bruce Tite Foundry. They're not identifying the uh, borders that are being used. Or, or tell you that you can you know, use these in a colorful way. And this has, uh, has not been digitized yet, this, this, this uh, specimen. Here's an example of uh, color used in a decorative fashion for a divider in uh, one of the Berthier uh, specimens from the 1880s. There are several of these available online and they're amazingly huge books. And this section is all about jobbing types or as they call them in France, uh, travaux typographique. And our last example of use of color is a small uh, specimen for the stop typeface by uh, Aldo Novarese for Nebbiolo in 19, early 1970s. Uh, this is from a letter from archive website. And uh, the typeface called Instant Logo uh, back in the 1970s uh, has letters that are not complete. And this overlapping set of colors is the word stop. And the specimen was, was designed by Novarese as well as the typeface. One thing that interests me, and I can see I've already gone on for an hour, so I might have to speed up is the content of uh, the specimens. I'm interested in you know, not just you know, what the typefaces are, but what else is in the specimens. And then as we'll see, what, you know, what do they use as the text for the, uh, for the, to show their typefaces? So some of the things you're gonna find in a type specimen over time, obviously typefaces. And I'm not gonna go through all the different types of typefaces, whether it's Romans, black letters, Greeks, Hebrews, Arabic, uh, other non-Latins, uh, music, music types. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not actual letter forms. Uh, so you're gonna find ornaments, decorative material, which is things beyond just individual fleurons, like entire frames and borders, 
uh, rules, both rules that are functional in terms of you know creating uh, uh, timetables and price lists, but also rules that are decorative, uh, what are often called special items. And those can include uh, characters for chemistry, uh, characters for astronomy, uh, characters uh, for railroad timetables. Some of these in the 20th century became known as dingbats. Uh, you can, you, you'll find a lot of music in some of the older type specimens because setting music uh, in printing was very difficult. Uh, you find cuts, meaning uh, stock cuts, or what we might call, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've got the, you know, the, the sort of the little images that you uh, might need in a design. Uh, and then there's material that, that as type founders got bigger and bigger, they began to sell along with their type, material for setting up the type in the, in the press, uh, and also material used to do that work, such, such as, um, you know, uh, ham, uh, uh, shooting sticks and, 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 and mallets for them. Uh, and then to the point where they began selling machinery, printing presses, guillotines, cutting machines, folding machines, and furniture to store your type and furniture to store your inks and other things, whatever they thought a print shop might need. And then you even find some you know, companies selling miscellaneous stuff, especially in the digital era, things like t-shirts and other swag or merch. And we'll see one example of that as we come up. So here is uh, one of the most famous uh, broadside specimens in type history, the burnt, the, the, Eganolf Burner specimen of 1592, which helped people identify types by Garamont, Grand John, and others, because along with the uh, name of the type, it says small, Petit Canon de Garamond. Or I can't read that one, Brevier de Garamond. So that this specimen has been very crucial in understanding who designed what types. But if you look at it, besides different typefaces, we've got a border made up of fleurons, and we've got some here by, by Robert Grandjean, which are called the Grandjean arabesques. This is sort of your standard uh, printing type specimen of the past. Uh, here's your typeface, here's your typeface. Uh, but if you look carefully, you've got Great Prima Roman number two. Typefaces didn't have names originally. They simply had a style, such as Roman or Italic or Hebrew. And then they began to get their sizes, which were not our point system. So things like Great Primer, Brevier, Canon. The reason we have number two here is Fry, the founder in this case, made a different version of a Roman at the same size as one they already made. And I'm letting you know that it's new. And the same with the Italic to go with it. I think this is one of their Caslon knockoffs, now that I look at it carefully. Because around this time, 85, 86, uh, they, they announced that they had done some knockoffs of Caslon's types, which got the Caslon foundry quite upset. I mentioned uh, Fournier Lejeune's uh, Manuel Typographique as a two volume book, though the two volumes are not both type specimens, all the type is in the second volume which came out in 1766. The other one came out in 1764. Uh, and here you can see uh, where uh, Fournier is showing you the same point size or the same body size, but two different sizes of the body of the letter itself, as opposed to the body of the type, big I and medium I, as, as, it's, as the French would be directly translated. So in sense of an optical, you know, choice he's giving his uh, clients with these two typefaces. <coughs> by, the 19, by the early 19th century, type is getting larger and it's getting more decorative. It's aiming at a uh, commercial uh, advertising market rather than a book and newspaper market. And we start getting typefaces like these. Uh, which comes from the 1848 Bruce specimen. This one has been digitized by, I think, RIT, uh, Internet Archive. Um, and you can see that the typeface names, though, are still 
very descriptive and not, you know, fanciful like they are today. Eight line pica ornamented. So you, it's eight lines high and it's decorative. And it's the third typeface in that category. ATF used to promote themselves as the creators of the uh, type family concept in 1906. Uh, I'm not sure that they were the first to come up with the idea of type family, but they were the first to actually use the phrase and to promote it as a concept. So there are some typefaces from the 1890s that are families in practice. And here they are promoting the most famous of their first families, the Cheltenham family in their 1906 specimen. Uh, and they're actually, the text is quite funny. Miss Cheltenham, the lusty twins, Master Cheltenham and Miss Cheltenham bold italic. Tomboy's sister, Miss Cheltenham Bold, condensed italic, Sir Cheltenham Wide, et cetera, et cetera. I think they'd have a field day with today's uh, gender, gender options in, in, in labeling their typefaces. Uh, the family got much bigger than this later. This is only what they had in 1906. I mentioned that type specimens quite early on got beyond just showing you letters and uh, figures and punctuation. So here we've got the Boubert foundry in Brussels in 1777, showing you signs uh, for almanacs, zodiac signs, phases of the moon and the planets, aspects of the planets for things like uh, horoscopes, I suppose, and astrology, and signs for algebra. Small sample of what is available. Herman Zoff made a set of dingbats for ITC in the early 70s. Uh, it's probably one of Zoff's best known uh, type designs uh, to the average uh, designer. Unfortunately, you don't get them digitally anymore. You get a different version called Zoff Essentials from Linotype. But here is uh, the UNLC spread announcing them back in the 70s, once again in color. And uh, dingbats uh, was a compilation of a lot of the miscellaneous things that type foundries had been doing uh, in the metal era. Uh, symbols for religion, arrows, pointing fists, stars, uh, card symbols, uh, modern things like airplanes made in the USA. Um, it's a telephone for those who don't know what the telephone used to look like. I don't think you could do a cell phone dingbat today. Maybe you could. Uh, pie fonts are a modern equivalent of dingbats in the digital era. Florons or ornaments uh, were, were there for almost from the beginning. Here is uh, an example from Fournier, who was one, very famous for his Rococo ornaments. Uh, and you notice they have to number them to make it easy for customers to know what they're going to get. And they're going to be available in multiple sizes. You're going to, if, you, so if you look at Fournier specimen book or Bedoni or some others, you will see the same designs repeated because they're at different sizes, since this is metal type. This is a 20th century design by Ernst Schneidler. I gave a talk at Cooper Type on Schneidler's typefaces. I don't think I, sh I showed his ornaments. Uh, he did not do the type on this page. I don't know what the sand serif is. It might be Shelter and Geiseke uh, grotesque. Uh, but the ornament's beautiful in this design. It's just a two color design from 1913 from a specimen book. You get some very strange ornaments in the late uh, 19th century from American type foundries. I think McKellar Smiths and Jordan were the first to do these, but other, other foundries like Bruce uh, copied them. Uh, designs where you may have little little uh, birds and cattails and boats and vases and urns and even a mosquito or dragonfly. And you can make pictures out of these. And you'll find a lot of examples in the artistic printing uh, period that people were, uh, printers were making their own designs uh, from these like, you know, here you're looking through a window. Some, some of these were patented. In fact, this one was patented, 1879. I just love the dashes. You start looking through the, the specimen books in the early 20th, early 19th century, they've all got these beautiful pages of ornamental dashes. Uh, and some of them could be, some of them are complete uh, lines and some of them apparently could have been created by combining individual components. 
Uh, this is from uh, uh, Bauer and Bacon. It's a St. Bride specimen. It's been digitized from 1830. As I said, rules uh, for, as functional things, uh, type foundries made those usually in brass. They'd be more sturdy than uh, lead. Uh, this is from the Klinkhart foundry in 1883 in Germany. And you can see all the different types of rules you get, multiple lines very fine, and then you get thick and thin, the people call Oxford or Scotch rules, and even thick rules that are six, six points sometimes in thickness. And the artistic printing uh, phase of, of, of uh, design in the late 19th century even led uh, foundries to make special curved rules so that printers wouldn't have to do the curving themselves. This is from uh, the Bertier foundry in 1895. I mentioned music, music from Enskede, 1768. Uh, they uh, had, their music was cut by Fleischmann, who's known for his uh, broke or transitional typefaces. And Fleischmann, along with Breitkopf, uh, they're considered the pioneers in making modern music uh, possible, not the old square uh, styles of music you know, from the Middle Ages, but what we were used to with a little uh, ball or uh, sort of lobe he heads. Uh, and setting this stuff is very complicated because you have to set the staves as well as all the different musical symbols and the notes. I mentioned vignettes or cuts. Uh, here's an example from the Boston Type and Stereotype Foundry, 1832. Uh, everything numbered and the price, 50 cents for all of them. It's an interesting mix of creatures, including a grasshopper. These are, are probably woodcuts that would have been stereotyped. So they could, and then uh, cast in metal and mounted on wood. Later, we started to get electrotypes and these are from uh, Colhemus, a printing a company out of type foundry uh, in New York in the late 1890s. So it looks like some of the designs might be a lot earlier. And if you're gonna do, uh, artistic printing with type on a curve or serpentine, it helps to have material uh, to set your type along. And type foundries began creating that by the late 1870s and early 1880s. The earliest I've seen in the specimen book of 1878 from Bruce, this is 1882 from them, the same uh, image. Uh, and the black is showing you the, the parts that normally would not print. This is all the furniture in letterpress printing that's invisible normally. And you have special pieces with a zigzag or sawtooth, and then other pieces that are curved, so your type can be easily fit. Long before the Dottists and the Futurists were doing this stuff, and you get all the various things for the compositor to use: tweezers for small type, engravers' tools. Uh, this is from ATF in 1923. Their 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 last big specimen. From one of the French uh, specimens, uh, Berthier, 1885. As I said, they sold printing presses. This one was the new Minerva. They actually made printing presses also, I believe. They're, listed, they're, 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 they're called engineers and mechanicians, as well as a type foundry. And as I said, you find some merch. This is uh, the Nutra boomerang chair to go with the Nutra face typeface from House Industries. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, they used to also sell uh, pillows and all sorts of atypical uh, type foundry material. I think uh, House has been a pioneer in that area since early 2000s, if not the late, 18, late 1990s. The content of a specimen uh, is all sorts of things. There's news about what the foundry is doing. There's promotional stuff about typefaces or other material. There's, believe it or not, practical advice on how to you know, set type or how to do designs technical information about point sizes, about the alloy of the type metal, all sorts of things. Of course, there are price lists, you know what things cost. Sometimes there's a history or the background of a type design. Sometimes there's a theory or ideology behind a type design. Those are more 20th century uh, things. And how the design process goes, which I thought was a 20th century innovation, but we can trace it back at least as far as J.F. Unger in 1793 explaining uh, how he hired Didot to make a, a Didot-style fracture and how Didot failed and how he then had to make a fracture himself that was in a new 
neoclassical manner. Um, and we even find uh, parody in some specimens. Uh, here is Thorogood in 1834 announcing a new script, one that didn't have to be made up of little individual parts, which I take as a stab against Firmindito or his, as his, copy, his uh, copyists in England. Instead, this typeface, I think, has a, slow, has a slanted body. Um, here is uh, Caslon uh, in 1785, or actually his descendants, uh, announcing the, the, the longevity of their foundry. And so it's uh, talking about how they've you know, been around for 60 years, uh, at casting type, and it's you know, considered the best type in England. So of course, you should continue to patronize the Caslon foundry. So a little bit of self-promotion there. Uh, here's a promotion for a specific typeface and why it's the trendiest around. This is ATF for its Nubian typeface, a really uh, lively color-wise uh, specimen from the late 1920s. It's available at the uh, University of Wisconsin website. And in this, they talk about how it's the right typeface to go with the syncopations of jazz music. Uh, and that these bizarre modernistic types you know, satisfy the advertisers who realize that they must provoke attention toward their advertisements at a glance. And the alert printer ought to get on this bandwagon. Are you an alert printer? I mentioned advice. Uh, one of the uh, most amazing books for advice is Linotype uh, did a huge specimen book in 1923, the Linotype Manual of Typography. And basically it's using its typefaces uh, as a way of showing off, he shows them off by telling uh, printers how they can design, how they can lay out their pages, how to deal with margins, how to deal with, with, with decorations, with initial letters, uh, columns, etc. This is uh, the section on how you deal with your margins. ATF, the same year in their last big specimen book, even has advice at the back of the book on how you set up your printing plant and, and they will you know, consult with you. So here's, here's an example of how you can set up your printing plant with the, the rows of type cases, uh, the, the, the proof readers, the proof presses, the, the, the larger proof presses, paper and rolling charts. I don't know what this woman is doing. Uh, maybe she's making labels, I'm not sure, but you know, so even that shows up in a type specimen. Of course, it's, as you can see, page 1018 and 19. It's a huge specimen at the back. History of type, history of a typeface, the background. Adobe was really known for this in the 1980s and 90s with their small, small specimens, but they were not the first. Uh, here is uh, Olier and company in Paris in 1914 for their Garamont type, which is a real Garamont, not a Janon design kind of got ignored because of World War I. Uh, I don't know why they put the little C there and never a big initial. One of my students asked me that last week and if anybody knows, uh, my only guess is that they wanted to only show off Garamont types and they didn't want something else. Uh, but this is an essay on the history of Garamont types before Beatrice Ward's famous uh, article in the 1920s in the Fleuron. Uh, here is Unger's uh, a page from his specimen of 1793 explaining how Herr Didot tried to cut a German typeface or fracture for him. Uh, and this page is set in the one that Didot set. Other pages of the specimen show what Unger did himself, which is a better design. This announcement comes from a specimen that exists in several versions online. The one that Pierre Didot, Fuhrman's older brother, did in 1819 to show the typefaces that Monsieur B. Bear had cut for him, uh, which you can find digitally as Optimo D, uh, Dido the Elder. And it's a kind of dull looking specimen, but if you look at the first page, the avis or notice is actually an explanation of the idea behind the typeface. And Pierre Dido takes credit for telling Mr. B. Bear to make these unusual letters like the G with a serif on the loop at the bottom. So this is a very useful uh, document. Dwiggins uh, explained the background of this Caledonia face that came out in 1939 and how he was trying to make a typeface 
uh, sort of like Baskerville, sort of like Bulmer, sort of like Scotch Roman. Uh, and he goes through all his, you know, thinking, showing you, you know, obviously doctored, uh, especially made uh, diagrams uh, explaining his thinking. Uh, and this is where he's showing you Baskerville and Scotch, Bido and Scotch, Martin and Scotch, and eventually he ends up with Caledonia, um, which gets its name from the Latin uh, name of Scotland, the Roman name. In terms of ideology, the most famous specimen is the Futura one from Bauer uh, with a text by Paul Renner, which uh, a couple of months ago, uh, with the help of Dan Reynolds and uh, another friend, uh, uh, we did a sort of machine translation of it and put it up on my website if you want to see what he actually says uh, in the German, because what he says in the English is not identical in the English specimens. This early specimen from 1823 that St. Bride uh, digitized, the entire text is all about a man's uh, travels in uh, the United States. Uh, the specimen comes from a, a, a Scottish printer. Uh, and so he changes uh, the font as, as, he, as, as the, the narrative continues. I haven't read the whole thing. I've only read it in a page or two. When uh, Emigre did Mrs. Eves in 1996, they did a specimen. And I don't know whether they were deliberately uh, tweaking Adobe across the bay or not, or just tweaking the idea of you know, having some historical background to a classical typeface, but there's a, a fake set of letters between uh, Voltaire and Baskerville that uh, uh, Brian Shorn created for the specimen along with uh, Susanna Lichko's thoughts about her design. I think it's one of the more important emigre specimens. And here's a spread uh, showing these uh, letters complete with, uh, you know, trying to, I think, I think it's footnotes. No, maybe not, just, just numbering the, line, the, the different entries. Um, my favorite of the uh, sort of parodies of specimens is the one for the chalet typeface that House put out in the uh, early 2000. And it's not the most interesting visually of their specimens, but the text is fabulous. The whole thing is a deadpan uh, uh, you know, parody uh, of, of, a, of a normal uh, type specimen. In this case, they're, they're saying that the type is designed by Rene Albert Chalet, a fashion designer. His typefaces were famous in their day and, and now forgotten. They're actually you know, pioneering uh, examples of sans serifs. And then uh, they have uh, quotes from type designers, you know, talking about Chalet from Ed Bengat, uh, Eric Van Blocklin, Matthew Carter, Jean Francois Porches, Tobias Ferrer Jones, and they're hilarious as they, you know, all, all uh, you know, you know, support this uh, fictitious uh, designer. I mentioned other things are useful for the uh, for printers. This is a, a chart on how you can justify your typefaces from the Inland Type Foundry. Here's a price list, one of the more beautiful price lists uh, from the Flinch Foundry, which eventually became part of the Bauer Foundry. How to use a typeface is a common thing uh, in the late 19th century and in the 20th. Uh, this is from a shelter in Geiseke specimen showing uh, Ornaments, but although ornaments is what's the name of the specimen, they're also showing their typeface uh, called uh, shelter uh, gr grotesque, which is the basis for the souvenir typeface that ATF did and that uh, ITC uh, revived in the 1970s. This is the better design of the three. Uh, here is uh, Bauer uh, showing the beaten typeface, one of the uh, the modernized slab serifs of the 1930s. Uh, this is the New York. Uh, branch of Bauer uh, doing a specimen. So there's a woman in her big Lincoln car in the 1930s. Specimen I own from uh, Bauer for the legend typeface from uh, Ernst Schneidler. It's a portfolio that in, inside has samples of how the legend typeface can be used along with a showing of, of the character set. Uh, so there are business cards right here. And some of the business cards, when you open up this black folder, are tip-ins. Uh, there are sample uh, music textbook pages. There's other uh, sample pages. This is like a little um, a fashion uh, brochure. 
early specimens, what, what, what does the text actually say? A lot of them are religious. Uh, I just chose a, a Breitkopf and uh, a Breitkopf specimen with the word God, very large. Not Breitkopf, I'm sorry, this is Haas. This is the original foundry that Helvetica eventually came from. This is 1790. The foundry goes back to, I think, what, 1760s. One of the most common uh, things to see besides religious texts and early specimens, at least after Caslon in 1734, is a quote from Cicero, quosque tandem abiteri Catalina patientia nostra, I think it's, uh, and here you're seeing it 80 years after, uh, uh, 90 years after Caslon from the Fry Foundry uh, with bigger type and the word gentleman added. And I'm surprised at how long this Latin phrase lasted uh, one reason for its use was that yeah, it was the idea that Latin type made it made uh, a text look better than English or German type because you had fewer uh, ethnic and descenders and you didn't have weird letters like W's and K's, so you had a more harmonious uh, text text sample. What's interesting is uh, when the Boston type foundry uh, used uh, the close blade tandem text in 1856, which is quite late, for a couple of the the sizes of the type, they translated it into English. And I don't know if you can see that it doesn't look quite as nice, or maybe it's just that this is not the best digitized uh, specimen. But here, uh, there's three that are in English. How far, O Catalan, wilt thou abuse our patience? Once the quosque tandem uh, abutere text dis begins to disappear, uh, what you find is random words and phrases. Here's an example from the Bruce Foundry of 1865. Here's one in the 1920s from Shelter and Geiseke. But sometimes you can find interesting things hidden among what looks like random uh, texts. And the most famous of those is the work of Thomas McKellar of the McKellar Smiths and Jordan Foundry in Philadelphia. His, uh, their specimens, were written by him, and as Alistair Johnston pointed out in Alphabets to Order, they are hilarious. You know, every line is carefully thought out. Uh, it's really hard to choose a page to show you. I picked this one. Uh, I loved phrases like crunching dry luncheon and mournful reflection and stomach dejection. These specimens are worth looking through just for, 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 for McKellar, McKellar's uh, texts. He also wrote poetry. This uh, book from South America, our only example today, I just discovered a few weeks ago at Columbia. It's not listed in their catalog. It's from Buenos Aires. And when I went through it, I was struck by how many of the texts were South American in content. Uh, and this page, I didn't think was necessarily that until I looked up all the names. And even temporarily is a suburb of Buenos Aires. All of those words there are suburbs. Uh, other pages uh, like uh, re refer to Simon Bolivar, so they're not all Argentinian. Some of, I mean, some of them are for other countries in South America, and obviously Patagonia. I think is what is, is in the name of, of this particular typeface. So this is a specimen that I wish that would be digitized. Uh, it's very fascinating. I don't read Spanish, unfortunately. I've been looking at the. Bruce specimen of 1882, because it's a text which you'll see on the next slide, is all about the history of printing. I thought that was quite revolutionary until I discovered that Zata in 1794 in Venice had already done a similar thing. For this size of the Garamont type, which is not a typeface by Garamont, but a size of type, Garamone, Gar uh, it has different names in different languages. Uh, but the text is all about Lorenz uh, Koster, the Dutchman who for many years, people said was the real inventor of printing in Europe, not Gutenberg. Uh, and other pages talk about other uh, people in the history of printing in the Zada specimen, which comes from St. Bride and Internet Archive. Here's a page from the great 1882 Bruce specimen, which I'm hoping to write an article about. Uh, this one uh, you know, shows you uh, text all about uh, Sonnen and Panarch's typeface at Subiaco, the first printers in Italy and Griffo's type, first italic for Aldous Minucius. Unfortunately, Griffo's not getting the credit he deserves here. You can also just find 
literature and specimens. The British often uh, took things from Shakespeare and Spencer and other uh, of their of their you know uh, classic authors. This is from Spencer's *The Fairy Queen*, for for Milton Richards' uh, specimen book dedicated to the old style types in, the, in late 1860s. The date is uh, we don't quite know. Different uh, different libraries give different dates to it because there's no date on the actual specimen book itself. And the last example is uh, newspapers were a major customer. And so some foundries like the Bruce Foundry, in this case, the Dickinson one, made imitation newspaper pages to show how their typefaces would look in a real newspaper. Thank you. And thank you to various people for helping me uh, either in real life specimens or online ones. And we have time, uh, Alex, for yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Do you want to do you want to go through? Um, actually, I, I, maybe if you stay um, in the share screen, if you wanted to switch to. There's a question about the lesser known resources of finding type specimen. Um, uh, my go-to's are archive.org and Hathi Trust. So I think that's like a good question to maybe. Let's, let's could shed light on like what you wanted to share before we take a few other questions. I can do this new share. Um, worked when we tested. Let's see if it works now. Yeah, that looks good. I got, let, me, let me let me let me. Are you seeing it full size, full screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. My original idea for this this uh, talk and one which I'm, I'm hoping that we can do again for Cooper Type is to strictly do an online sort of flipping through um, specimens and surfing the web to find specimens. Um, I didn't do that this time because I realized that, I, that there was so much stuff that people needed sort of as a background for understanding specimens before sort of diving into that. Um, but I picked out like I think eight or nine uh, specimens uh, to possibly look at. Uh, Tonight, and I wanted to focus on uh, the, the best the, the best sources in terms of the amount of stuff. And the first is Google Books. But as you can see here from this specimen from a Swiss uh, foundry, and I kind of picked some of these at random. I mean, I don't know much about this foundry at all. I just wanted to show you the fact that Google Books uh, digitizations are crappy. They're, all, they're black and white almost always. They're not even really sharp. And the only thing good you can say about them is at least you have something. Because if you can't get to whatever library owns this uh, specimen, there's no way you'd even know about it, to be able to see it. Um, but it's really worth it for libraries and other and museums and others, if they've got you know, a copy of one of these specimens, just because it's already up there from Google, make a new digitization. <laughs> and that's gonna be true for some of the other sources. Um, there's an avis, a notice, like the one for the Pierre Didot specimen. I'm just going to click through a couple of pages so you can see that nothing is, there's no, there's no improvement in the quality of scanning. The, the yellow is for my highlight in uh, searching for it. It's not part of the, uh, the digitization. Uh, you'll notice in this particular specimen that they're showing you the typeface uh, with different lettings, which I didn't talk about as one thing that they'll find in specimens is not just, here's the typeface, but here it is used differently. As one of my students uh, wrote over the weekend uh, for my class, uh, that, that, was, that the typeface could look very different just by changing the letting. Uh, and that was a very big deal for, for specimens uh, in the pre-digital era, actually it's still there in the, in the digital online version. Let's go from uh, Google Books um, to, um, are we still seeing this now, Alex? Yeah, this is still, yep. Working. Um, Hathi Trust, or Trust, I think is how librarians tell me they pronounce it. Uh, an organization, an outfit in, I think, Ann Arbor, Michigan, my hometown. And they um, they put up, put up uh, digitizations of things from libraries. A lot of them are Google Books, but not all of them. Some of them are only available on Hathi Trust. Others are available in more than one place. And usually on Hathi Trust, you'll get, you'll get them in color. 
oddly enough, a lot of when you did, if you download them, will revert to black and white. Not always. I don't know what the thinking behind this is, what what why they're doing this because these things are out of out of copyright. But I chose a, a Spanish one here, um, and this is this is. Uh, the one that I and when you when you open up any Hathi Trust one, they come up too big. You're going to have to shrink them if you want to see everything in one page. So I'll use the plus or minus. Um, the page numbers are PDF numbers; they're not page numbers. And so when I talk about these, I always have to remind myself to say PDF page number, not like physical page number. Um, but you can download usually um, a single page from almost everything. Uh, you can't always download an entire book. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can if you have a university access. Uh, other times you can't do it at all. Um, but this, I chose the Spanish one because a lot of the types, is, they're, they're, they're kind of fuzzy. I think it's the original printing are clearly influenced by Dido. And one of the things you get by looking at specimens online, you begin to see influences from country to country, from foundry to foundry. Uh, and across time. Uh, and so it's one way we can sort of trace actual typefaces as they were sold or as typefaces were being you know, copied or imitated. Um, and if you want to view it uh, and get a quick option, go to thumbnails if you don't want to just, because some of specimens can be incredibly boring. Some specimens start with the big, the, the big stuff up front, others start with the small stuff up front. Uh, unless you're you know, focusing on the small stuff, uh, going through that can be really tedious. This one starts with, with, with uh, vignettes, which is odd. And I can't get to my, to my scroll bar because it's blocked by the Zoom window, <laughs> sorry. Um, but there you can see a range and then the end of the book. Um, Gallica, which is a uh, French website from the Bibliothèque Nationale Française, so it's, B, it's Gallica BNF or BNF Gallica, uh, is a fabulous site. Some of the digitizations are just as bad as Google. Others, though, are really nice. Uh, this is a good one here. And they also link to other French um, websites, and I'll, I'll talk about another one uh, after this. So here's a specimen from Baudoir and Company in 1900, I think it is. I chose it because it was horizontal uh, and because uh, there's some a bit slow to, to load. So up front, you're getting uh, prices and information about weight of type and what, what's in a font of type. Um, how a type how a type case is laid out. A lot of a lot of foundries have this. Here's some of the material that you find sometimes in the back of other foundry cases, foundry specimens, scissors. You can also do a, a thumbnail uh, at Gallica. Uh, you notice it says no NP, meaning no page number. So it's kind of hard to remember what, you, what you've got. And you can download individual pages and you can often download entire books from them. And through Gallica, I discovered uh, the Bibliothèque Fourni, or sometimes it comes up as, as uh, Petronym, Petromoyen, my French is terrible. Uh, this is an amazing uh, library in Paris. And what they put online, they, they seem to have a huge collection of type specimens. There's several hundred online. They're, they're, they're high quality digitiz digitizations. And when I first discovered them in 2020, you couldn't download them. And then in 2021, in the fall, when I went to look at them, they were downloadable. And it took me like a month to download every one I could find because they're huge files, like, like over a gigabyte. Uh, and sometimes they, they get hung up. So I would recommend you download them in batches. Uh, otherwise, you may find that you've wasted a couple hours and gotten nothing because the, the website has crashed or whatever. I don't know what happens. Um, but this is a, a specimen of wood type from 1860, and it's in color. It's not chromatic type. It's just, come on, I have to click on this and it should show up in the big window. And it's not doing that. Now we can do, do it this way then. Oh, whoops. Whoa. I've never done that. You're going to have to refresh the page. Maybe it lost. No, I, I hit, I hit uh, fast forward, not forward. 
That's my mistake. I've got all these things blocking my window here. Um, anyway, I would. Uh, it's it's going to take forever to refresh. It's a slow. No, if people are saying the website is down. It may be down for people. It's a slow website, and maybe we've crashed it. But <laughs> if you can see the pages in the thumbnails at the at the at, at the side, this particular specimen has a lot of American designs or American copies. I don't know which. I mean. I have to see if David Shields knows anything about this specimen. It's pretty. It's pretty cool, though. Um, but this is this is a this is a website I would definitely recommend. Um, then, as I said, then as I said, there's um, University of Wisconsin. I've mentioned uh, they have a collection from uh, the um, Silver Buckle Press, which was a uh, university private press. I think it's still going. I know the woman, Tracy Hahn, who ran it for years, retired recently, but I think somebody's replaced her. And they digitized their collection. Um, every time I, 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 I click on a link from it, though, I get sent to like a, a home page and not to the actual specimen. But here's the one I was looking for, which is a Hamilton specimen from 1960. Um, and the details are, I can't see. There we go. There's my scroll bar. It's a bit odd the way it's set up, but you you can you can go to individual pages. So here's a history of wood type. This is 1960, which is why I chose it because we don't think of wood type in the 1960s. But as we all know Hamilton exists as a museum today, and I'm sure they've got copies of all of these. Um, so that. And they've got, I forget how many of specimens. What you'll find with some of these collections like this one is some of the stuff that they've digitized and they label type specimen is, are not type specimens. They put other interesting uh, books about printing letterpress uh, or typography into the, uh, you know, the, the, the group. I just discovered that with St. Louis Public Library last week, you know, where some of the things are, are interesting, but they're not specimens in any, by any means. Um, RIT, uh, which has a great collection, uh, has been doing a nice job of digitizing uh, their specimens. They put up the 1882 Bruce last summer. Uh, and you've got several ways you can look at their stuff. This is uh, Mirador, a page, sort of a way you can flip through the specimen. And I chose Robin Eklund from 1836, because when I flipped through it last week, I found this, these two pages showing uh, Sanceris. Specimen was 1836, and we shouldn't have an 1836 and serif in the United States. 1837 was supposed to be the earliest, but it may be that these pages in the specimen are post-1836. That's something which I'm trying to investigate now. And it may be that they're taken from Thoroughgood, because that word mountain sure looks familiar to me from Thoroughgood's 1834 specimen, but they're called Gothic, not grotesque, which is interesting. So, you know. This is something I just stumbled across because I never heard of Robin Eklund. This is what you, this is what, what digitizing specimens does. It, it, it gives you new things to discover. Um, so we can flip through the pages like this and we can see a lot of the typical things of the time. It's the only specimen that this, that this founder did under that name. A couple others were done under the name of Mr. Rob in the 1840s and they're not digitized yet. And I've not seen them. Um, oh, I'm, about a year or two ago, uh, ago uh, about, yeah, 2021, uh, two huge caches of uh, type of found uh, type system came, uh, were issued by um, German uh, type founders. Uh, the other libraries, uh, Dan Reynolds uh, told me about uh, one from the Stats. Bibliothek in Berlin and another from uh, the Technisch uh, Deutsche Museum, I think also in Berlin. And there's, I think there's a little bit of overlap in a couple of the specimens, but we're talking like several hundred from each uh, website and you can download them. And uh, they're, they're generally quite good. Uh, I was flipping through uh, one of them last week and sent an email to Dan and Indra that I came across Excellence grotesque in one that was the Kindhart foundry, 18, uh, with a date of circa 1897, 1912, dates which apparently Dan Reynolds uh, provided to digitization. 
So I wasn't sure whether this was from 1897 or not, uh, but I was curious that it was from Tynart. And Dan explained that uh, at this point, Bertolt owned Tynart, but, uh, but this specimen was not a specimen Tynart put out. It was a collection of loose specimens that was bound. And therefore, Dan gave it a date range based on what was in this collated specimen. And so it was kind of a little warning that when you see some of these things, you know, they're not necessarily what the foundry itself issued at one time. Um, and we can just see a couple more uh, pages of accident of grotesque. If you come to a white page like that, it's because the back of the page was not printed, but they still scan these, the libraries, because it's often of use uh, to specialists to know that it's blank on, on the back of the page rather than printed on both sides of the sheet. Um, so there's your familiar accident grotesque, but it's spelled here with a double C, not a CK. Um, along with um, the two uh, German uh, caches, it was enormous. It, uh, in in uh, fall of last year, St. Bride finally uh, put a couple hundred of their specimens online through the Internet Archive. Uh, and they're one of the biggest uh, type specimen collections in the world, maybe the biggest. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many Columbia has or some of the German libraries or the, the place in Paris. But what's interesting about some of the specimens is some of the extra stuff in there. And St. Bride made sure that they scanned everything. So in this specimen, of, of the very first one from Vincent Figgins, 1793, which it says here, the first specimen of, this, of, of, of uh, this foundry, very rare, doesn't even have a cover. Uh, there's a title page. And so these are notes by uh, librarians at St. Bride's or whoever collected the specimen before they entered St. Bride's. I don't know whose handwriting, whether it's William Blades or uh, Barry or even James Mosley. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure Bob Richardson might be able to tell me or even James Mosley would, would, would know. Uh, it's like most internet archive things, sometimes it's slow to the page. And you get notes like this. This is from Fry's Fund. So although this is a Figgins specimen, somebody has identified this as not being a Figgins type. They put being somebody else's either Figgins worked on it or he was selling it. Uh, you can see others that say these are from Fry's Foundry. And some of these specimens include uh, letters that have been inserted and other ephemera. Uh, and then the last uh, thing is, uh, so these these are these are sources for a lot of uh, specimens, you know, a hundred or more. Uh, well, I'm not sure if Wisconsin has that many, but they certainly have, you know, thirty or forty. Um, but there's also uh, places that you don't expect to find specimens. And I was looking last year at the the the, the Deutsche Library in Leipzig uh, at their uh, Jan Chickel. Uh, collection, which was digitized, in, I think, think the summer of 2021. And, you know, going through all of that, I kept stumbling across uh, Chickle's work as a type designer, but also some specimens. So this is a specimen of his uh, transito type face done for the uh, type foundry in Amsterdam. There's actually more than one copy in the collection. There's also some proofs uh, for the type face and other uh, uh, in process uh, material. Oh, the one page only. Oh, no, wait, hold on. No, there's more. There we go. A typeface clearly influenced by uh, Paul Renner's Futura Black. So that's all you get in this particular example in the uh, in the in the Chickle collection in Leipzig is just two pa uh, two pages. The third being just a page to show you the color. Uh, color card. So if you want to, if you want to correct for color and everything. So that's uh, just a little, a small sampling. Um, I can stop the uh, screen sharing. Uh, there are lots of, of odd places uh, to find specimens. Um, I was looking through Stephen Coles's online uh, guide to specimens, and 
there was one that I didn't have in my list, and it was from the University of Rostock in Germany. And it's a really good Breitkopf specimen. Uh, and I looked for other specimens from the University of Breitkopf and got nowhere. Matter of fact, in my searches, they wouldn't even acknowledge that the Breitkopf specimen was there, which is odd. I, I, I was trying all sorts of, of, of terms. Maybe I, it's just because I don't know German, but I tried everything I could think of. And I, you know, why that one got digitized, I don't know. Maybe it had to do with something else with Breitkopf, who was a publisher uh, of music and of books and a printer. Um, but uh, there are specimens, uh, you know, hiding in a lot of places. I've found them when I've gone through the inland printer, I've found like, you know, a spread of four pages uh, showing typefaces from you know, some of the American uh, type foundries. That's awesome. Uh, Paul, thank you uh, for such a thorough um, look at this, the subject. And I really appreciate the the depth of detail and, and the range. Uh, as always, your, your talks are, are fa fabulously prepared. And I, I really, uh, I think it gives, gives folks like a sense of what the type specimen um look like and and what to look for and, and where to find and also like uh, uh amazing amazing uh, uh gratitude for putting together the the website with all the links i think it's just an invaluable invaluable resource so i appreciate and the type community appreciates this i'm actually trying to put all 1700 or whatever that i've uh found online i've been doing it chronologically it's different from the way uh stephen coles is doing it and stephen's working on books so a lot of things that i'm putting on don't qualify for what Stephen's trying to do. So we're not duplicating each other, but kind of, uh, you know, supporting each other, I think. In mm -hmm. the, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put comments to some, and John Lane and Dan Reynolds and others have, you know, made suggestions about either correcting dates or, you know, uh, comparing some specimens to others. Uh, so in some cases, I've added comments from John and others to what I've put up already. I, I'm up to I'm up to 1830, but I've already had to go back and add that bright cough one in <laughs> this morning, and I'm hoping to you know to eventually go all the way into you know 2000 or whatever the last one I got is. Yeah. Uh, so if I, you know if you, if you want to take a few more questions, I can do. Them. Yeah, I think. Um, well, you you just answered David David uh, Shields's question. Uh, hi, David. Good to see you here. Um, he was asking about the overlap between Stephen Coles and, and and yours, and I think you just just alluded to it. But there's a there's a question. I think we have probably time just for one. I uh, Craig Eliason asked. Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I kind of hadn't thought of this, but, but it's a really interesting idea or question. Um, Craig writes, do you consider Stanley Morrison's Tale of Types book to be a type specimen? It functions to show off monotype text types, but maybe came out so late. Um, that the promotional intent of specimen was expired. I would definitely call it a type specimen because they were still selling the typefaces and he was showing them. It's not in my list that I've been kind of because it hasn't been digitized, but I could have included it in my talk. It, it didn't occur to me um, wherever my copy is. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that, that's where I think, you know, like, like John Lane might disagree with me because I mean, we were talking about specimens and he was saying, you know, type founders versus printers and how I really ought to separate those out on, in, in what I've been putting up, up online, though. They, they use, they're usually identified whether they're a printer, if I know they're a printer. I don't always know. I just, I, I sent an email to Dan the other day about what I discovered recently online. And he said, that's not a printer, that's a type founder. And so... You know, unless, you know, unless it, you know, it's, there's, there's, there's some, you know, phrase that gives you a clue, uh, you, it's hard to think, to find that out because they usually don't have text. You know, there's a title page and then that's it. But I'm, I, I try to be, I try to be loose on this stuff because I want people to discover the material, you know, and if they discover it for some other purpose and maybe it's not a type specimen, fine. But I, I think tally of types would qualify. I was unsure whether I would to put in uh, Zoff's Manuale Typographicum, which is, which is, the two books he did, uh, they're both, you know, inspired by, by Bedoni and, and Fournier in terms of their name, and they are showing off typefaces, uh, but um, they're also showing off Zop as a designer, a typographer. Uh, they're not from a, spe a single foundry, even though most of them are from Stemple, there are some that are from other foundries. Um, 
but you know they function as specimens. And if you want to see what a typeface looks like, and that to me, it, you know, at, at, at heart is what a specimen should do: is what does the typeface look like? What characters are in it? You know, how does it look at different sizes? You know, uh, how does it look in different you know settings? Those are the basic things that designers and typographers have always, and printers have always wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 really great. I I um, I think that there's a lot of information that uh, folks have, have have gleaned from this. And and for those who are still here, um, certainly we will post this this video as soon as possible. We'll add the link to um uh to paul's uh, uh um uh, annotated list um to go along with it so if you wanted to watch this back and 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 or certainly go through the the website and click through the links just to see the fantastic resource that paul put together and the type community thanks you um paul thank you so much it's always a pleasure i wish we were in person uh to shake your hand and and and, and see everyone in person but um yeah. We're able to do it at least this way, but uh, we we'll look forward to to seeing everyone in person soon. Uh, I wish everyone a good night. Uh, for some, it's very late, <laughs> so <laughs> I hope I appreciate you you joining us tonight. Um, and uh, of course, uh, come back um, March thirteenth when we have uh, the Kiev Tai Foundry here. So, and our heart goes out to to people in Ukraine who are bravely bravely putting up a fight, and of course the people. Um, who are suffering from from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria? So uh, it, it's our our thoughts and heart is is with everyone right now. So be safe, be healthy. Um, we will see you all soon. Thanks again, Paul. A million thanks. Yeah, let's thank everybody else who came to listen. Thank you.